Uh, kia ora toto. Um, it's my great pleasure to present our first invited speaker for the conference. Uh, Phil has a, an amazing background. I asked him a little while ago if he was actually a professional plate spinner because it, it looks as though his work with, with government, with business, with educational agencies would require something of that sort of dexterity. Maybe he's got a few inside tips in terms of what's going to happen to education in the forthcoming years might be helpful. Um, so Phil's going to talk to us about connection, uh, connection and context. Uh, but I think probably the most important thing that I can share with you is that in his real life, Phil is an avid goat farmer. So <laughs> without further ado, please welcome Phil, our first invited speaker. Thanks very much, Clive. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about goat farming. <laughs> um, actually, I was thinking on the way up, I've been um, working in the L&D space for about 20 years now, and uh, I can say with some conviction, actually, that probably in the last two or three years I've seen more change happening in learning and development in, in commercial and government contexts than I have probably in the previous, previous 18 years. And so it's, uh, it's great. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak a little bit about what's happening in learning and development and in commercial and government and to connect that up to the sorts of things that we see happening um, in adult higher education and, and perhaps explore some of the linkages that might exist between those different sectors. Um, I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about the context of what's driving what we do see happening in learning and development um, and then explore a little bit how L&D as a function within organisations is responding to it, what it's doing and its, its efforts to respond to the challenges that are being put down, challenges laid down for it, and then join some of the dots between that world and what you might be doing in tertiary, tertiary educational institutions um, to make the linkages that you can into those organisations. Um, there's a theme running through most of the work we do which is about one way or another starting to focus on measuring the impact of learning. It seems pretty fundamental and critical to most of the things we were doing, so I'll, I'll close out with a few comments about um, measuring the impact of learning in the workplace and where some of the linkages might be in that space as well. Um, but just to give you a bit of a sense about Synapsis so you can understand where we're coming from, I've uh, been around since 2004 and our background was in the education sector, so we started out um, producing learning resources and consulting for primarily polytechnics and that grew off into government uh, and to corporate. And so we're really comfortable with the notion of pedagogy, I don't mind saying it, I say it quite regularly. Um, and we've hung on to that sense of truth around good learning. But I guess we've explored other contexts that we've got as we've gone. And so what I'm going to try and do is, is draw some of the linkages between those different sectors and some of the commonalities that we see happening across them as well. Um, so I guess as a starting point, what is it that's, that's driving this activity in learning and development? Why is so much activity happening just now? I was at the Training and Development Conference in Orlando um, late last year, and I was quite fascinated by the emergence, the sort of the rise and the rise of the Chief Learning Officer. Um, everyone's familiar with the Chief Financial Officer, a Chief Executive Officer and so on, and it's quite fascinating to see the number of Chief Learning Officers that are starting to pop up around the place. It's, it's not a new role, General Electric had a Chief Learning Officer in the 90s, but what is interesting is the number of organisations that are starting to make decisions to put someone around the executive leadership team table to speak from a perspective of learning. And that, that in itself is quite a powerful statement about how learning in government and, and corporate organisations is being valued more than it has done in the past. So if you ask the question, why is that, then reports like this Deloitte report are quite informative. This again came out mid-late last year. Um, it was a survey done of about 7,000 um, executives across 130 countries. And they're asking about what are the, the top drivers or what are the top tools that those people want to use to build talent to develop people in their organisations. The year before, learning and development had come in at number eight spot, and last year it came in at number three in terms of strategic importance to those organisations. So the top line shows how important it is. The bottom marker is an indication of how ready organisations felt that L&D was for the challenges that were being put in front of them. 
and you can see that that's down around um, 46 on the scale. Um, previous year, 70% of organisations thought L&D was good to go. Last year, 40%. So not only is there a big ramping up in terms of expectations and the ability to deliver learning, but there's also a real consciousness around the fact that there's some work to be done. And I guess if you want to think about or try and quantify what's the scale of the opportunity for TEIs to engage with corporate and government, that's a really good measure of the scale of the opportunity that sits in front of you. 60% of organisations plus believe that they've got a lot of work to do in this space. So stepping back again, peel another layer off the onion, why is it um, that this is the case? And if I sort of contextualise that in terms of our experience in New Zealand and think about what are the challenges that we're hearing about from our clients, um, what are the things that they're saying to us that might heighten the need for L&D to drive that, it's actually surprising how homogenous they are across all the sectors we work with. The big one is the pace of change, um, the need to be responsive to that, the fact that learning is critical to enable staff to continue to cope with change. Um, in a competitive space, competitive advantage is going to come out of more so the people in the organisation than five or ten years ago what might have been pure innovation space. I know these themes are quite familiar to you as well, they, they are endemic, but um, I guess my comment is that if you want to ask why is learning becoming so prominent, it's because the challenges that all of those organisations are facing are very similar and ones that are probably familiar to you too. So I guess l and is going through a bit of a facelift. If I can be slightly cynical about it, L&D used to be mm, a little bit sort of fluffy and a little bit sort of opaque and of course people did need to go and learn but it was always a bit unclear about exactly what it did mean for the organisation. So, you know, it was an expense line in a budget and it was important but it was always a little bit, I don't know, a bit unclear. And the new face of L&D is really that it's a strategic tool that it's something that people are really serious about, that it's something that needs investment, that deserves investment, and needs to be taken seriously. And so I guess that's what we would see is the gap between the 46% and the 78% is, is, is the need to get really serious about how L&D functions in these organisations. So if that's the context for L&D, what are they doing about it? How are they responding? There's, uh, I guess I think there's about four points I'd, I'd like to make. And the first one is um, the notion of investment is becoming central to how people think and function. The idea that there is a budget line, that there is a need to place people on courses or to engage them in learning and for them to complete that activity and report that activity as a cost, we're not hearing that much anymore. What we're hearing about is a starting point around a need that needs to be fixed, a problem that needs to be fixed and an investment in the fixing of that problem. So you're starting to get L&D entities being much more engaged in understanding what makes a good business case, how are we going to measure the impact of what we're doing, how are we going to sheet that back, and a recognition that if they don't do that first time round, there probably isn't going to be a second time round for them. So the conversations that L&D are having are changing in response to what's going on in those organisations. Um, and there's an interesting piece about how they're starting to approach how learning happens. And the flipped, the flipped classroom's been around for quite a while now, people are pretty familiar with that. But there's something happening which we're starting to think of in terms of potentially being a flipped curriculum. And by that I mean, how is it that l and is thinking about, or going about the process of deciding how to act and, and what to do by way of learning? So the traditional model was that you identify an appropriate program of learning, that people do that program, that they get a qualification as they move through it, that's some evidence of value. Um, that then has a flow on effect where people change how they work in the workplace and that brings back a benefit to the organisation. And in that model it's reasonably easy to see where tertiary educational institutions fit into that frame. There's, there's a clear placeholder to engage and have that conversation. But the way it's tending to unfold now is quite different. The starting point is, we have a problem, what's the benefit we're trying to get from that? 
Is it about retaining staff longer? Is it about getting them engaged in the organisation more early? Is it about their level of satisfaction that they get in their working life? That defines a change that we want to see. That in turn results in some thinking about a program of learning, which then has some impact, some measurement of the impact of that. But the program of learning isn't driven out of some starting point of an existing frame in any way. It's driven out of what the problem is that needs to be fixed. So it's a lot more nebulous, it's a lot more unclear, and it's in some ways a lot harder to articulate what it is that you might contribute to that solution. On the other hand, it may be that it's potentially quite a little bit more productive as well because it's directly sheeted to what those people need. So starting to see the flip curriculum emerging in terms of what people are doing. Just to give you a practical example about that, um, HHL group is uh, eight entities, about 6,000 staff, they work in the community health space. Um, their drivers have been around, they really want high level of engagement with staff from the first day. Um, and that's not just about initial induction, that's about the culture of the organisation and how it functions, the particular entity they're in and where it sits in relation to the others. It's about the new health and safety framework and the fact that directors can't get insurance for liability for accidents happening on the workplace so we better know what's happening there. There's a whole bunch of things which are impacting on how they think about that program. But they also want to see a qual recognised out of that. Traditionally that type of organisation would have gone to market to find a qual. They would have looked at the relationship to that qual and what they wanted and they would have tweaked it or played with that qual to do what they could to apply it on job. And it's quite symptomatic now that places like HHL are tipping it on its head and saying, no, no, actually put all that aside, we're going to define our whole learning experience. We're going to talk about what we want in the entire programme and then we're going to go out and we're going to see what we can map out of our own activity to get the qual recognised in the background somewhere. So the qual becomes a secondary or tertiary aspiration after the design and execution of a programme which is about the people. We, we tried to do that about seven or eight years ago with a consortium of polytechnics that were producing uh, trades-based resources across 17 quals and it was back in the days of unit standards and we just about literally chopped up all the PCs and threw them up as confetti and they all came down and we, we grouped them into logical work tasks and we pulled them together and <coughs> tried to map it back and think about some naturally occurring evidence so that we could tick off the fact that they'd done something real and they were going to get it collapsed. It just couldn't be done. It was just far too hard. But that sort of aspiration is far more achievable now, I think, and particularly when the organisation starts by driving what they want out of their own needs first. So that's, I guess, an example of the, the flipped classroom in practice. Um, the third area is around the whole, um, I guess, 70-20-10 piece. Um, and of course a recognition that around 10% of learning typically is driven out of a formal structured experience and 90 is, is out of the, um, of the, the observation or the informal on-job piece. I've always, I've always been a bit cynical about the notion of 70-20-10, um, where we've come across programmes that have been driven around that and you start to ask a bunch of questions about the 70 bit and say well you know, how's that informal stuff happening on job and what's the structure for it and what are people getting out of it and how's it going? You get a lot of sort of mumble grunt kind of comments in, re in response to that and it almost sometimes feels a little bit like the 10's definitely happening, the 20's happening a bit and the 70's not actually happening all that much at all. Um, and if you were to look at 70, 20, 10 from an investment perspective and say where's all the effort being put in, it's probably more like 5, 5, 90. Well, we're starting to see, I guess, 70, 20, 10 being honoured uh, in the way that it was intended. Um, a recognition of the fact that just because it's informal doesn't mean that you don't have to spend time and effort putting in place an understanding about how that learning is going to happen, who's going to be supported through it, how is someone supposed to know what they're supposed to be doing in that context, and how are you going to get a sense of that activity that comes out of it. So quite a shift towards um, a lot more emphasis on proper buddying models. Uh, an example of that in government is we're working with Immigration New Zealand who, amongst other things, look after our borders and keep us safe. So they have border control with border officers. Um, 
they're in a high pressure environment, legislatively driven, a lot of rules, um, low turnover and difficult scheduling, really hard to run structured learning experiences for those people. Huge emphasis going into buddying models where it's certainly a lot more structured than an informal conversation and it's about embedding tools and resources and activities on job, in job, to provide the structure that people need to genuinely learn in an informal way. So again, a real ramping up of the game in, in that sort of that more informal 70-20 team space. Um, and I guess the last one that's maybe the most significant is rethinking or getting more serious around the use of learning management systems. Um, I've spoken previously about uh, the analogous maturity model that organisations tend to go through where they'll start off experimenting, they'll get some traction, they'll build some volume, they'll try and get the whole thing aligned a little bit and then they'll, they'll get strategic about it. We sort of track that process happening typically over three to five years for a lot of commercial organisations. It's happening now in about eight months or they're actually coming straight out of the starter blocks with a view to wanting a strategic tool that they're using in the organisation. <coughs> so that's about um, not so much approaching the LMS from a tool that connects an audience to a course, but it's about locating someone in an organisational structure with relationships with managers and with peers and with others, sitting in an annual performance cycle and having that whole experience driven out of a tool where it becomes much less about uh, administrative efficiency or getting e-learning content out there and much more about changing the way people think and function in the whole organisation. So I think the potential for LMS is to be leveraged a lot more significantly in these sectors is really starting to emerge. Um, yeah, so I've made that point that traditionally the paradigm is sometimes seen as here's an audience, here's a course, connect those two together, get the course completion and report it. And that's turning into a model where you are seeing someone located in the organisation, they're driving the experience themselves to some extent out of the goals that they think that they want to achieve, either for their organisation's benefit or their own. They're engaging in a range of different tools or methodologies for achieving that learning and then they're sheeting that back to demonstrate um, the fact that they have acquired what they need to or they've developed the skills that they want. So a more sophisticated model. Uh, it's becoming half of the course now, which is really encouraging, I think. BCITOs, uh, the industry training organisation, obviously for construction, they've, they've got a guess, a guess of flavour on this, which we found quite interesting. Um, like a lot of ITOs, they're emerging out of TROC, they're emerging out of the global financial crisis, um, they've got the Christchurch earthquake to deal with, so it's a time for them to be reinvigorating how they think and we supported them around framing up a, a vision for digital engagement. And this is how they describe the change that they're going through. So the traditional model is the focus is about gaining a qual. BCITO works with the apprentice and the employer for that to happen. The vision that's starting to be implemented now <laughs> is that sure, the qual exists, but it exists in the context of a career and a life as a person. And sure, the relationship between the employer and the apprentice is really important, but so is the relationship with family, community, wider interest, engaging with resources that are available and out there. So again, you're seeing that deepening in the sophistication of thinking around what that learning experience might be. The latest Deloitte reports come out, um, just out now recently, and in terms of L&D, what it's saying globally is that there's going to be a, a continued move towards ownership of learning by employees. I think, Kurt, you made the comment about um, uh, someone who is a teacher, someone who facilitates learning, and the move towards now is someone who's curating learning. And I'm sure Joyce will have more to say about that in the next day or so as well. So they're picking up on that trend towards ownership of learning by the employee. I'd have to say we're not seeing at hitting those sorts of levels in New Zealand yet. I think we're probably two or three years behind some of the stuff that's coming out in this Deloitte report. But if you want a signal to the future, it's, it's probably quite a good one. Um, one area where it is happening is in health. Um, so we're working with Canterbury District Health Board and other health boards around the South Island that are moving to a model where uh, 
It doesn't matter who I'm employed with and how many organisations I'm employed with, and it doesn't matter over what time that's happened, my learning experience will be managed out of a portal where it's about my life. And it's not that the employer's a bit player, but they are contextually important, but the point is that my learning experience will continue for the duration of my work in the health sector. So you're starting to see those sorts of approaches starting to creep in. So if that's the context, and if that's what l and is doing about it, what are the sorts of things that we can point to that offer some sort of spark or connection um, for tertiary educational institutions? Um, I, I guess the first point is, like any conversation, you've, you've got to be speaking the same language. And our take on it is that the transition from 2010 to 2020 is seeing your counterparts in a commercial world talking much less about knowledge and much more about application much less about process and much more about outcome. So if you're finding that you're having conversations about knowledge and process, it's going to become harder and harder and harder for you to engage with your counterparts. And in fact, if you do want to engage, then that is the language that you need to be using around application and outcome, if you want to engage on their terms anyway, I guess. I guess the, the next point is that we all tend to see things in terms of unit of currency. We all have a dollar that we're familiar with. Uh, and, and often in tertiary education, that dollar, that currency, is, is a course or a program of learning. Because L&D is heading off much more into a space of fixing problems, uh, I guess our view is that if you want to be part of the process of fixing those problems, the unit of currency is going to become less and less relevant uh, to those players around how they want those problems solved. What they're looking for is evidence that some form of learning intervention has fixed a problem for them. The course of itself is probably not going to do that. But when you think about the, the assets that you have and your ability to paint a bigger picture where you're engaging with them as a service offering to solve a problem, then I think the upside is huge. The number of tools that you can pull together to meet that need uh, is, is quite compelling. You've got the strength of research and engagement and the ability to fold that into the solution that you're coming up with. Um, you've got a, 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 quite an emerging field around the ability to take learning and have it applied on job as part of the learning experience. I think of some of the stuff that um, Capable NZ is doing, I think out of Otago Poly, and the recognition of, exist, of existing skills and competence of people in industry at the point that they start the process of engaging in programs is getting a huge amount of traction. And certainly anecdotally we hear of a lot of people finding that sort of model really appealing. Um, you've got the explosion of informal and unstructured resources and offerings that are out there and your ability to fold those into um, the, the package or the offering that you're making back to industry. And ultimately I think there's quite a big space to play in in terms of measuring and reporting learning back out into organisations as well. If you can think about packaging stuff up across those sorts of assets, um, then ultimately you're providing a solution to a problem, which I guess is what's being asked for. The challenge in that, I guess like any organisation, it asks for a whole of organisation response. It asks for a coordinated response from teaching faculty, from those involved in research and evaluation and those involved in industry engagement. So we spent a reasonable amount of time working with um, BD teams from TEIs that are out engaging with industry and there's always a tempering of enthusiasm around the, the challenges of executing this stuff when it comes in. Um, bottlenecks around the ability to customise content or constraints around academic calendars or curricula can mean that it can be hard to execute and I guess the trick is in how you provide enough flexibility for people to go out there and make it so, but still getting, keep them connected to the mothership, the organisation that they're in, the TEI, and, and ensuring that those indicators around quality and pedagogy are maintained. It, it, it's a really tricky balance, and, and it's not one that's limited to education. Um, we did some work with a communications company that had a global sales force dotted around the world, and they figured that they needed to provide more autonomy to their sales teams as a way of um, building local engagement. Um, they realised they'd gone too far when one of the sales teams came back and advocated that they should be able to sell competitors' products rather than their own products. So, you know, 
there is a limit to how far you can go. But, but what I would say is um, there's no point in going out to find the opportunity if you're not in a position to execute it. And one way or another, you've got to, you've got to free that stuff up. Um, I guess if we are heading down the path of informal learning, learners driving their own experience starting to dominate, then it raises the question about whether you should actually be talking to learning and development at all. And in fact, whether the conversation you should be having is directly to learners and how far that can be taken. And when you look at initiatives around not just open educational resources, but collaborative <coughs> ventures between institutions um, and the, the desire to appeal directly to learners, then I think that's a very fertile ground um, to move forward. Granular pieces of learning, small chunks, um, not necessarily hooked up into one particular curriculum area that people can self-drive and demonstrate value back is probably going to become more and more dominant as a way of engagement and delivering value into um, to government and industry. I guess the, the last point I wanted to make is um, perhaps there's also the, the opportunity for learning to be, to be reciprocal. And I, I, I can't remember where it was, it was a tender came out recently and it was for TEI and it was headed up a transformational project. Um, it was a really interesting term, and I think that, that tender spoke to the fact that uh, the challenges that are happening within education are no less dramatic than they are happening in industry. <coughs> and for organisations that we work with that are attempting to move on a large scale to a blended learning model across a, a, a predominant uh, numbers of their students, there is a huge amount of transformational change going on in that process from rethinking program design to migrating that down into course level design where you can actually leverage technology tools well, um, to reframing activity so that you're working in teams rather than isolation, um, to developing the skill sets for effective delivery of blended learning. That's a massive process. Um, and, and perhaps there's something to be learnt from um, the organisational development model that approaches transformation in the corporate or commercial world in the same way. So when I left law and started practicing, I uh, started uh, teaching on the National Diploma of Business in the 90s, um, the professional development model that I had was absolutely fit for purpose. It was great. It was a mixture of the development of the teaching skills that I needed. It supported me in terms of my subject expertise and ability to stay current and the research piece was still coming at that stage, but obviously it's arrived. But I guess my question is, are those hallmarks an adequate response for the scale of transformation that's happening in these institutions? And to what is it sensible to start to think about this type of model as one to support uh, academics, staff, and how they um, respond to what's happening? Um, there's two or three places we're talking to where um, the organisations, the TEIs, have Moodle as a baseline for delivery of their programs. It works on an audience course model, joining those together for reporting. And there's a growing awareness that maybe that type of paradigm, that type of technology tool, isn't quite going to cut it when it comes to the level of change that academic staff need to go through to cut across all those things that are happening. So we're finding that we're sitting down with someone from HR in the TEI and professional development. And they're both talking about uh, an audience course technology tool perhaps not being fit for purpose. And I find it really encouraging. I always found it a bit odd in some ways that professional de development was almost exclusively driven out of, out of the academic space. And the HR probably didn't really have too much to say about developing its people. And it was more to do with payroll and that sort of thing. Um, but peculiarity of ed the education space, and it's, and it's kind of interesting to see those two things starting to come together now. So perhaps there's some exchange of values to be had around the way transformation is managed in some of those sorts of organisations. Um, I just wanted to finish with a few comments around measuring the impact of learning because it is beginning to underpin so much of what we do just now. Um, I made the comment about the fact that the, the conversation is shifting to application and outcome. And with that comes a shift in evaluation and measurement. From a Kirkpatrick perspective, uh, measuring the reaction to learning is going to become less relevant. Um, measuring knowledge is going to become less relevant. Measuring application of learning to the job 
measuring the return back for that learning are going to become the drivers of an evaluation process more and more and more, we believe. So what hope is there in that space? I mean, it's a difficult one. Um, typically, for some years, the conversation has sort of gone, well, look, we do we do, do the face-to-face -face evaluations in, in our LMSs, tracking knowledge, but uh, we know we should do more, but it's actually really hard. You know, it's hard to connect um, the effort we're putting into learning with what happens on job. We, 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 we're not sure about what that connection is, and a lot of it's qualitative. Um, it's not the sort of stuff that a chief financial officer is going to find all that compelling. So, you know, we'd like to do it more, and we feel a little bit embarrassed about the fact that we're not, but it's bloody hard. Well, yes, it is bloody hard, but it's becoming bloody important too. So where do you go with that? I mean, there's some emerging tools which are, are quite interesting and offer a lot of promise. Um, this one is the Philips Learning Analytics tool. It's out of the Netherlands. Um, Kirkpatrick and Philips, they kind of duel it out for global domination of the evaluation space. Kirkpatrick's got their four levels and Jack and Patty Phillips rode the world first class doing stuff on evaluation, some really powerful stuff around learning. So they've gone out and, and built a tool which is designed to measure the impact more from a corporate perspective. Um, you start with the change you want and you end up with really compelling data. So the tools are there. I mean, the, the challenge with that one is that it probably costs more to use the evaluation tool than most budgets have got for a learning intervention. So, um, okay, it's a start. What I think offers probably a lot more process, process, uh, um, offers a lot more value is the tools that are starting to emerge that build onto or bolt onto LMS functionality and start to provide a much richer environment for assessing learning and how learning is going. X-Ray is one, it's a Blackboard product that I think is quite fascinating from the perspective that it doesn't just track um, the e-learning that people are doing, but it's got quite sophisticated algorithms that look at the interaction that's happening between learners and facilitators, not just in terms of volume of activity, but in quality of activity as well. And using that as a tool to predict those people that are at risk um, from not completing, and therefore putting you in a position to manage the limited resources you've got around those that most need it. So that sort of tool, I think, is something which is worth looking at and offers a lot of value. Um, it's an important piece of the jigsaw, um, but it's probably not the whole jigsaw. If you think about the 70-20-10 model, and if you run with the proposition that about 70% of the learning is happening almost invisibly and informally out there on the job, it raises the question about how good a lens you've got on what's happening if the analytics that you're running only relates to that stuff which is being managed electronically. And so there is a bigger picture out there that needs to be folded in in some way. Sometimes digging deeper in the data is not the complete answer and that it is appropriate to be falling back to wider qualitative processes to build that picture. Um, it's an area we've been interested in for some time and We've been working to develop what we think are good indicators of the likelihood of uptake on job. So if you think about the things that really matter, it's things like, what is my relationship like with my manager? Will they spend time with me? Do they value the learning that I need to do and will they support me to find space to do it? What's the fit between the learning that I'm doing and the strategy of the organisation? It might be a brilliant piece of activity, but if the organisation strategy is moved and it's no longer relevant, it ain't going to deliver a lot of value. So we've been working to, to frame up, I guess, a set of indicators which we think are good ones to be asking about in terms of understanding the likelihood of the application of that learning on job genuinely meaning something. Uh, and that's then modelled up in a tool which runs through a series of surveys to give you a polar map view about the relative strength or weakness of the program. So in this case, this particular one's looking at, at the process of performance management in the organisation and how well the performance management cycle is really supporting learning to be applied. The manager's attitude, the level of support, the KPIs for the job and that sort of thing. So it's an area where we think there's a lot of opportunity, while not necessarily giving a $2.21 ROI, to build 
a, a much more three-dimensional view about the entire learning process that goes beyond what happens electronically. Um, there's a couple of projects we're running to do evaluations just now. One's with Z Energy, so as a fuel retailer, um, they have a set of retailers who own gas stations up and down the country. They normally own six or eight each, and it's almost like a franchise model where those people need to essentially train their own staff supported by Z. So Z's run facilitator training for the retailers. Um, that stuff's around the brand, the culture of Z, the secret source about why you should pop into your local community gas station, and we're measuring um, the extent to which that training that the retailers have run has impacted the way um, that Z is hoping that it will in terms of how staff act. Uh, the flip side of the coin in an academic context is uh, Otago Poly has quite a, a significant um, capability development program running that's got, got a very collegial based model and they're interested in knowing how much that capability development model is supporting their staff to cope with the sorts of transformational changes that, that I talked about earlier. Um, and I, I guess what I, I like about that is that here's one tool being used to support both a commercial organisation and a TEI. And, and it brings me, I guess, to a concluding comment around the fact that while there might be a lot of differences, there are also a huge number of similarities in the sorts of challenges that we're all facing. Um, and it's about our ability to build on those similarities as much as it is our ability to, to see the difference. Um, when, we get in, thank you, when we get engaged with a client, it takes us, I don't know, two meetings to make a pretty rapid shoot from the hip but often pretty accurate assessment about um, how the relationship's going to unfold. And we tend to characterise it as whether we're seen as a supplier or a partner. And if our client thinks of us as a supplier, then they generally tend to come from a space of scarcity more than abundance. They'll tend to see it as a transactional relationship. We're assuming that we're probably most looking after our own interests first, but doing good for the client along the way, and that we'll need to be managed, and that we'll need to ensure that the outcomes are what we said the outcomes were going to be. Where we're engaging with clients who see us as a partner, they recognise that they probably don't know exactly where they're going. Um, there's a fairly good chance that the best outcome is not the one that they thought of at the beginning that they're looking for a partner who is flexible, is willing to change, is prepared to reframe the engagement almost on a continuous basis, and that ultimately will end up at a much better finishing point than we would have done had we stuck to the traditional supplier model. And so I guess I'd just conclude by saying that given the level of commonality that there is between the sectors that we all work in, probably the biggest defining thing that will make the biggest difference around success in any collaborative engagement will be your ability to partner rather than to see it as a transactional relationship. Thank you. Cool. Big thank you to Phil. Um, I think you know, I took three things out of that um, that invited uh, presentation. The first was the bird's eye view that uh, Phil managed to give us in terms of what's going on out there in the business and um, corporate sector, sector as well as, as, as government, uh, and where we fit in that puzzle as far as education is concerned. Uh, the importance of relationship building uh, that are obviously on the horizon if they're not already there. The prevalence of change and our response to that change. So, uh, Phil, thank you so much for your uh, picture of the landscape, so to speak. Um, I'd like everybody to join me in thanking Phil once again for that presentation.